for Lee's message he asked me to read Philippians 4 verses 8 and 9. If you are able, would you stand for the reading of God's word? And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me, everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. You may be seated. Blessings to you, Lord, to you, Lee, as you bring us his word. Thank you, Roland. If we could pray, open up. Father, I I ask that you fill our thoughts with your thoughts. Help us, Father, to understand your word, understand your ways. Help us to give glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, when Roland asked me if I would preach today, I started out with an idea, and then as I got into it, the idea kind of changed, and then it came back again to the same idea. <laughs> Where it changed is I was going to focus on a select number of verses from Philippians, and then I decided that I'd focus on the entire book. Um, fortunately, it's a short book. <laughs> so why was Philippian, Philippians, or I'm sorry, where was Philippians written? Philippians was written from prison. Um, couldn't find where it was, what, what prison that it was written from. Some people think that it was possibly in Corinth, some think in Ephesus, some point out it could be Caesarea, and others point out it could be Rome. From the internal evidence, it would need to be a short distance because it mentioned several, um, several travels back and forth. But it was written from prison perhaps under uh, house arrest, perhaps under more dire conditions, but it was written from prison. Who wrote the, the letter? Well, it was Paul. Um, he mentions Timothy um, as well as kind of like a we. But Paul wrote it, I believe, And he wrote it to the church at Philipp Philippi. Here's where it gets interesting. The question is, why was Philippians written? And I think my reading of it is that Paul was guilty of some of the things that I do when I write an email. Supposing I want to write an email to tell you that I'm, I'm going away tomorrow and I'd like you to check my house. Well, the way I would write it, intuitively, is I'd tell you about why I was going away, where I was going, how I felt about it. And finally, I'd get around to, oh, by the way, check my house in the morning. One of my coworkers called it burying the lead. It looks to me like Paul wrote Philippians as a thank you letter. Apparently the, Philipp the Phil Philippians had sent um, Epaphroditus a servant 
to minister to Paul. And I'm guessing as well a monetary gift. But at any rate, gifts. And Paul was writing to thank the Philippians. The interesting thing is, is while he was thanking him, he says, I really didn't need it. I'm, I'm okay. He's saying, but I'm really thankful, this is my paraphrase, for the benefits that accrue to you because you, the Philippians, sent Epaphroditus and, and, and the gifts. And I'm grateful that you have gifts accruing to you. That's my paraphrase, but we'll see as we go along. Who were the Philippians? Well, Philippi was named after, um, as recently as makes sense, because there's, a, a, it was actually changed names several times before this. It was named after Philip II. Who is Philip II, you ask? Never heard of him, <laughs> personally. He was the father of Alexander the Great. Now him, I've heard of. One of the things that's interesting is, is that um, they discovered archaeological, uh, some, somewhere in the recent past, they, they've discovered some archaeological um, findings about Philip where there's apparently a huge amount of gold. Um, so there's a lot of wealth involved. But the main significance to me is that he was the father of Alexander the Great. Um, and in 42 BC, Philippi became a Roman colony, which was a big deal because it meant that the citizens of Philippi could own property, they could file lawsuits in the Roman courts, and they were exempted from paying some taxes. I believe property taxes and a poll tax. I'm not sure what a poll tax is, but that's what my reference tells me. So how did Paul become associated with the church at Philippi? Well, the story is given in Acts chapter 16, which I'm going to read some of it. Now when they, and they is Paul and Solias, um, possibly Timothy, not sure, in that he's mentioned prior to this, but the story doesn't mention him um, in a way that I'm sure that Timothy was there, but definitely Paul and Solias. Now, when they had gone through Pergia and the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After, after they had come to Mysa, they tried to go into Bethyra, but the Spirit did not permit them so passing by Mysa, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come to Macedonia and help us. Now after he had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now I remember reading this in Sunday school, I think it took us about two years to go through Acts, if I remember right, several years back. And the reason that I remember this is because of Lydia, which is the next character. Lydia was a seller of purple dyes. And apparently, they got the dyes from a shellfish. And I remember this because I was immediately upon reading what I'm going to read next, 
was convinced that she probably was a seller of gold because gold, I knew from my days as a chemical technician, working with gold, that in its colloidal form um, is a deep purple, a beautiful purple, and it dyes your clothes purple. I know that because <laughs> I came home with purple dyed clothes sometimes when it splashed on me. When... So I remember this in Acts, but I never put it together with Philippians. And it's amazing to me how unified the, the Bible is. Therefore, sailing from Troas, we, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, and the next gate day came to Napolis, and from then there to Philippi, which is the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a, col a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out to the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made, and we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyrta, who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul, and when she and her household were baptized, she begged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. So what the commentaries tell us, or tell me that... that um, the Jewish custom was if you had ten men, then they'd have a synagogue. But less than ten, they would gather by the river. And that's what they were doing. They didn't have enough men, to, apparently, in this area to have a synagogue. Now, it, it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out saying, these men are the servants of the most high who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul greatly annoyed turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city, and they teach customs which are not lawful for us, being Romans. And here's the reference to Philippi, a Roman colony. To receive or observe... Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. So there's a reason why I'm reading this. There's a context to Philippi, to the Philippians, and its start is with Paul and Silas being thrown into prison and treated very roughly. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. Now, how did Paul and Silas respond? But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from the sleep, and seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword and was about to kill himself. But call, Paul called, with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm, for we are here. Then he called for a light, ran in, fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? 
So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved, you and your household. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to that to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes. And immediately he and his family were baptized. Now when he had brought them into his house, he set food before them, and he rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. So Paul and Silas were treated very roughly, stripped, beaten, thrown into prison. And they sung psalms. Their response was to sing sing hymns, giving glory to God. An earthquake happened. The jailer, feeling that, oh no, I'm I'm toast, because the prisoners are going to escape was saved, not only from being killed, but saved from his sins. As a, res- as a result of Paul and Silas's actions, their, their temperament, their behavior, their thoughts. And when it was day, the magistrate sent the officer saying, let these people, these men go. So the keeper of the prison reported these words to Paul, saying, the magistrates have said to let you go. Now therefore depart and go in peace. But Paul said to them, they have beaten us openly, uncondemned, Romans, and have thrown us into prison, and now they put us out secretly? No, indeed. Let them come out themselves and get us out. And the officers told these words to the magistrates, and they were afraid when they had heard that they were Romans, because they'd beaten them without a, without a trial. Then they came and pleaded with them and brought them out and asked them to depart from the city. So they went out of this prison and entered the house of Lydia. And when they had seen the brethren, they encouraged them and departed. So Paul's relationships to the Philippians is that It was a church that he had started by being thrown into jail. (laughs) So here I come back to my original idea. Why read Philippians? I think it's good to read Philippians because it gives us a different perspective. My father always used to tell me that when he had a problem that he couldn't solve with his own skills, he had a Rolodex in his head of how different people that he knew would solve the problem. And I've kind of adopted that not as often as I'd like, but one example of, um, of one way that I've adopted it is, um, you know, I'm not a salesperson. And a job interview is essentially a, a sales. You're selling, I'm, if I'm going to a job, I'm selling myself. Well, how would a salesman, the people that I know who sell, How would they approach it? Well, there is a saying that I wrote down because one of one of the things that salespeople do, at least the ones that I know that are really good, they tend to put things in nice, sweet slogans. That's what I call them. So one of the things that a salesperson that I know, they don't have a big issue with rejection. I'm a sensitive person. But one saying that I heard, and when I go into a job interview, I'm like, this is what I'm telling myself. Some will, some won't. So what? Next. It's a way of Somebody's going to take me on. I just got to find them. So getting back to 
to Philippians. Philippians demonstrates how a particular person, in this case, Paul, thinks and acts when they are faced with unfamiliar situations. What I'd like to do is read from Philippians, and as I do, I have an ask. I'd like for you to think along with me of things in your past where potentially Philippians offers a perspective that might have worked for things possibly in your present or for things past possibly in the future. By that I mean Philippians is a Rolodex. How would Paul approach this situation. It's a way of thinking with somebody else's head. Paul and Timothy, bondservants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi with the bishops and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he who has done a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just as it is right for me to think this of you, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense of and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound still more and more in knowledge and discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ, to the glory and praise of God. But I want you to know, brethren, that the things which happened to me have actually turned out for the furtherance of the gospel, so that it has become evident to the whole palace guard and to all the rest, that my chains are in Christ. And most of the brethren in the Lord, having become confident by my chains, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife, and some also from goodwill. The former, former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached. And in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. For I know that this will turn out for my delivery through your prayer and the supply of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, according to my earnest expectation and hope, that in nothing I shall be ashamed, but with all boldness, as always, so now also Christ 
will be magnified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live in on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor. Yet what I shall choose, I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I shall remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing from me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. Only let your conduct be worthy of the gospel of Christ so that whether I come to you or am absent, I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind striving together for the faith of the gospel not in any way terrified by your adversaries, which is to them a proof of perdition, but to you of salvation, and that from God. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me, and now here is in me. So here I'd like to interject. Paul's saying, you know, I'm in these chains. Um, the real possibility is, is that he may be executed. I mean, he is in prison. And I hear him saying, which is better, to be with Christ or to be here? And I hear him saying both are good. And it's an interesting perspective. Um, I may have mentioned this before, I'm not sure, but um, ever since I ran into it, um, probably about five years ago, um, there's a theory about how people act within relationships called attachment theory that is borne out by actual repeatable um, experiments where they essentially put a child with um, their caretaker in a room and pre present a strange situation and then the caretaker leaves and then the caretaker comes back and the observations on what the child does, how he reacts or she reacts to the caretaker is relatively predictable. Um, falls into, um, I've seen four categories and I've seen three categories, but um, basically a uh, secure response where the child comes, runs up to the caretaker and is comforted and then goes on to explore the room again and play. And the researchers called that a secure attachment. Um, the other um, two or three, depending on how you count them, are categorized as non-secure. And um, I could go on because I'm really interested in this, but I won't. Other than to say that Paul has a secure attachment, and I believe his attachment is to God. He's able to have the perspective that he has because he's obedient to God. He knows God's character. And he's confident that everything will pan out okay, even if he gets beaten, even if he's in prison. And the other items that are mentioned, he's confident. He's securely attached to his Father in heaven. Moving on to chapter 2. Therefore, if there's any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any affection 
and mercy, fulfill my joy by being like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or con- conceit, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father, of God the Father. So, I understand from other translations, some translations um, translate the word robbery as grasp, which probably gives a, um, an, an idea that probably makes more sense. Um, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it something to be grasped, to hold on to, to be equal with God. Moving on to to verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And here for me is one of the crucial points. Paul is obviously confident in God. He obviously has faith. But there's a part that Paul must do. And in applying it to me, there's a part of there's a part that I must do. And both sides of this is given in here very concisely. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life, so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. Yes, and if I am being poured out as a drink offering on the sacrifice and service of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. For the same reason you also be glad and rejoice with me. With with me. But I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you shortly, that I also may be encouraged when I know your state. For I have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Therefore, I hope to send him at once, as soon as I see how it goes with me. But I trust in the Lord that I myself will come shortly. Yet I consider it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother, fellow worker and fellow soldier, but your messenger and the one who ministered to my needs. So this is the Epaphroditus. So not quite yet. But he's finally getting around to why I believe the letter was written. And he's basically saying he's he's sending him Sending Epaphroditus back. Since he was, the reason why it, it, it follows, since he was longing for you all and was distressed because 
you had heard that he was sick. For indeed he was sick almost unto death, but God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. Therefore I sent him the more eagerly, that you may see him again. You may rejoice, and I may be less sorrowful. Receive him therefore in the Lord with all gladness, and hold such men in esteem, because for the work of Christ he came close to death, not regarding his life, to supply what was lacking in her service towards me. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilations, for we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh though I also might have confidence in the flesh. And here he gives the reasons why he might have confidence, which I'll skip over in the, uh, for, for time's sake. Moving on towards, pressing on towards the goal. Paul writes, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to be apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. Therefore, let us, as many as are mature, have this mind, and if anything you think otherwise, if anything you think otherwise, God will reveal even this to you. Nevertheless, to the degree that we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us be of the same mind. Moving on to chapter four. Therefore, my beloved and longing, longed for brethren, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord beloved. I implore Ayuda and I implore Syncity to be of the same mind in the Lord. And I urge you also, true companion, help these women who labored with me in the gospel and with Clement also and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, meaning Paul, These do, and the God of peace will be with you. And here we get to, finally, what I believe, and you're free to argue with me, but I believe it's the reason for the letter. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely didn't care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. 
Now you Philippians, Philippians know also that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church shared with me concerning giving and receiving, but you only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent aid once and again for my necessities. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that abounds to your account. Indeed, I have all and abound. I am full, having received from Epaphroditus the things sent from you, a sweet-swelling aroma, an acceptable sacrifice, well-pleasing to God. And my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. I hope this has been useful. Um, the idea to read um, most, if not all, I've, I've skipped a couple sections, including the, the very last verse, verses, came from partially from... Um, a YouTube video of one of my favorite ministers, John Piper, in which he literally, from memory, recites the entire book of Philippians. And I offer that to you as the way that one man, not me, perhaps one day, but how one man puts in his memory ways of dealing with problems, both in the past, the present, and the future. And um, I can think of no other way of concluding but to say my hope and prayer is that when in the future I come against problems that I haven't seen before and don't know how to solve, that I'll take some of my cues from Paul and I hope and pray that you all will do so as well. Thank you.